to the FBI Daily, I do think that the results are going to So, please, get in line. Um, so I do think it's going to be too okay? And when you see that on the number of points here, I think that to some extent it's going to be a little bit broken, right? Um, Rudy Gibb has said that he's going to be a little bit broken on January 1st. Um, and all of this to play for the after game really fast, so essentially he said, he's doing his job. But, but, if I didn't mention it, we should be doing it here. So, we're going to look at the security and the other stuff. So, we're not coming to the tournament of the series. Um, but, at the minimum, we don't know now whether boys and girls are going to be a team to be a team to be a team. Philip Michael or Michelle says I find it interesting that an Intel guy targeted the police first. Do you see the name of the guy you're referring to? An Intel guy targeted the police. Can you elaborate on that? Sword dance! Rinkidio Blade! Philip Michelle says, is this by the intelligence community to talk to the first point community? Again, so you're gonna need to fill me in a little bit of your exactly what you're saying. Um, Have you learned your lesson? You guys are talking about Nina Turner. Uh, and Turtle One says, so if they had looked into it, the feds do, don't come in and Boykin still has a job, right? Well that's that's what the police said. The police I spoke to, the one who brought the complaint to Buddha Judge said we don't want to go to the feds. We don't want because if you you go if you go to the feds, there's a good chance it becomes a public issue. And by the way, even when it did go to the feds, it didn't have to become a public issue. It became a public issue, and that's what 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 triggered all this stuff because of what Buttigieg did about the investigation. So the investigation was due to Buttigieg's inaction. And the public awareness of the investigation and everything that happened afterwards was because of what Buttigieg did about the investigation. He, meanwhile, had characterized these, all these things as the result of mistakes of Boykins and Karen DePape, the woman who heard uh, the recording, mistakes that they made. But in theory, there were ways to handle this where even if you decided to remove Boykin, even if you decided to remove the tape, in theory, you could have worked something out with them as well to avoid it becoming a public, problematic scandal the way it did. Oh. As to whether Boykin still has a job or not, uh, again, tiny spoiler alert, the question of whether, of, of how secure Boykins was in his job is going to be the subject of my next uh, the next installment of this series, which again is based not just on the police sources who I'm naming, but also on um, South Bend Insiders. Mm. 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 Heather Vesper, this is the comment I saw earlier saying, I'm trying to pay attention and follow along, but I'm a tad bit lost. But I see now that Heather came in a little bit late, so I don't feel too bad. Hopefully, if you've been with us from the beginning, you were able to follow along with this story. Um, Katie Kane says, Since when are conversations on county and city phones private? Every computer stroke is followed as well. Well, this is why it's still a legal battle, right? There are, there are people who point to city policies that say, when you're in the police department, you have no expectation of privacy. But you also have federal and state laws that say mm -hmm. you can't record the phone line in the first place without the consent of at least one party. Um, now there are exceptions to that. Uh, I think one is if there's um, if if phones are routinely recorded in the workplace. I believe I'm getting this right as sort of an everyday thing. Then you don't have an expectation that your line won't be one of them. So that's something that's been addressed in court. Now there's an exception to that exception, which is that if, however, your line is being recorded as part of an, an investigation then it has to have you know a warrant and, and all those kinds of things it has to have a legal justification for the recording and now there's some arguments that because the paper was listening at some point specifically because she heard things that she found troubling does that constitute an investigation that all of this is now a legal matter still being fought out in the court uh, 
Uh, Katie Kane says, were these county-issued cell phones or private home lines? These were, my understanding is, landlines within the police department. And so it would be incoming and outgoing calls on those landlines. Uh, Philip Michael, or Michelle, says, I think what keeps coming up in my mind is that this Buttigieg is a naval intelligence guy, strong ties to Facebook's Zuckerberg, rallies officers, detectives, to railroad the black police chief in two weeks. So there is not only no evidence that Buttigieg got these cops to do anything, there's a lot of evidence that these cops don't think very highly of Buttigieg. Now, you can go fractal with this and say, well, that's a false flag, man. That's what you want me to think. Okay. I'm not going to stop you from... You can always spin everything as, well, that's what they want you to think. So, um, that said, I've spent a fair amount of time with these guys on the phone um, and in person, and uh, there's not really... The, part of the issue here is that, well, I'm not going to get too deep into it because I don't want to tip my hands about some of the stuff that's coming. But my bottom line is, I don't think that's the case. There's not, there's no real, even before this stuff, there's no indication that Buttigieg was in contact with these people. One of the cops, yes, he absolutely was. Um, but there's no indication, even there's no indication that there was any kind of communication in any other context. No one reported that to me. Um, and they all, by the way, seem to be united in their belief that uh, the ones who were supportive of him as a candidate back in 2011, they're not supportive of him anymore. And by the way, if they were in on it, why would they be uh, telling stuff that politically damaging to him now, but not tell the entire thing. So, I think you have to do at least one too many mental parkour or gymnastics to make that narrative work. That's my own assessment. Leah Campbell says, basically, Pete's a hypocrite. Well, I, I mean, obviously people are going to interpret it however they want, but it seems to me that he's been less, less than truthful. Um, First of all, when he said, I learned from the fans about that there was an investigation, well, that's a little bit fudgy because we reported back in September that Schmuel told him that there might be an investigation. So Buttigieg actually knew before the feds even knew. So to say for the last eight years, I only found out about the investigation when the feds called me, that, that stretches credulity here, I think. Um, Neocortex says, if they are company phones, then anything said or texted could be considered public information. If the ban, uh, if the BSNS is a public BSNS, I don't know what the technical reference is there, but it's very easy for us to say, yes, this is legal, no, that's not, but this is bouncing around in the courts, and from the legal perspective, it appears to be pretty complicated. Leah Campbell says, apropos is nothing, I assume. Yay, Bernie! Okay. <laughs> Uh, Leah Campbell says, it sounds like high school. It 100% sounds like high school. It's done! Um, I promise that this is enough. But it's true, it's true. Uh, and there is sort of a, uh, what to me emerged as sort of a pattern of people not talking to each other in South Bend to address these things directly on their face. Uh, and part of that has to do with the fact that it's a small town, and a lot of these rifts and rivalries kind of get baked in, and this is, no one has told me this, this is just kind of me spitballing my own observation, but there is, therefore, a lot of siloing, and a lot of information doesn't make its way directly unmediated from person to person, but gets telephone gained through others, and then there's never any direct confirmation of what did you actually say? What did you mean by that? Do you see how this could be seen as meaning that? Doesn't happen. I'll check Stephen Greenfield while I was doing that. Sarah says, sorry, sorry. Um, do we know who started recording the phone lines or who ordered it? Right back in your ear, yeah. So the um, the phone line started to be recorded before Daryl Boykins even became chief. Now here's where it gets wrinkly. 
Each line that was recorded was recorded with the knowledge and consent and usually the desire of the people being recorded, typically the, the command staff or people just below command staff level, who wanted an easy way to record information that came in. It was both CYA, you can look up what that stands for, um, but uh, it was also good investigative, right? If you get a complaint about an officer and it's anonymous and you can't reach the person again, now you've got the actual call there. Uh, you've got audio of it, right? If it came through on your line. Um, what happened was that when that policy was instituted, they did not create or implement or communicate a policy about what happens if Officer X with phone line Y changes his phone line. What happens to phone line Y? So an officer changed his office and someone else ended up inheriting that phone line. But in the absence of a policy, no one tracked the phone line to make sure it stayed with the officer who had had it, and no one realized that the officer who was getting the new phone line for him didn't know that his was being recorded. So his line was recorded for quite some time until I believe it may have been in February of 2011. Um, uh, there was a malfunction with the system, and after the reboot, Karen DePape listened to all the lines, and on one line heard a guy she did not know as having a recorded line. And that's what got her first listening to this stuff, apparently. These are, this is according to what she has said publicly and, and legal documents that she submitted to the city. She was trying to figure out, is this guy using someone else's phone? If so, whose phone is it? Uh, what, you know, was there a cross in the wires? I'm making this stuff up, but this is apparently the kind of thinking she was trying to do. Why is this person on the other phone line? So on and so forth. And in the course of that, she heard some stuff that, that had potential legal ramifications, or at least internal policy ramifications. So she listened long enough to be able to say what she was, what she had heard and what she was reporting. First strike! Uh, Katie Kane says, Smooch! Ah, 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 sword! Sword dance! Um, ah, 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 I think it was not only the but it was also the the and 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 the 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 it's not exactly clear. Have you learned your lesson? He kind of alludes to it in uh, court testimony, but um, because he was Let's do our best. blocked by law from talking about the woman court, he testified that he was not able to get into detail about why he didn't stop the recording. Sarah says, how do you accidentally take phone lines? All the phone lines in the South Bend Police Department come through with the automated communication system that I work. And that has software in it that essentially all you have to do is make it tough. Check a box in the program and you have to take the program to the program. It might be a little more complicated. Shadow Flash! It's not that Daryl Boykin got his alligator clips and his wires and everything called into the crawl space and started picking things up. It took the question of have you played it out for each of these lines to roll on? That's the ogre sword! Sparrow counter! Lateral 
that's a day off. I feel lost in this time with more people stories because there are so many people involved. I mean, this is amazing. Maybe it was one of the great things, etc. I'm visually oriented. Uh, so the, uh, the roof. You're absolutely right. Oh, I really have the resources to generate this kind of fucking up in the city. You actually did a really nice illustration. I'm not sure whether they are using it. I think you're dropping that. Shadow Flash! Rick is going to dance! I did some of the articles and read the article. I have some idea what it is. That was nothing. Still so more names that you're going to have to so go ahead and check out the link I, I would ask you to do so um katie kane says we need an interaction diagram i actually tried to make one of those on little sis for my story last year on the fellowship foundation aka the family i just gave up it was too complicated um Uh, Alice Murphy says, remember to like the video. Thank you so much, Alice, and thank you everyone who likes it. It actually Let's get does going. help us, so if you feel like, ah, oh, what's the point? It's just an ego boost. It actually helps us, because it's also an eye uh, When you like the video, you can show it to more people. Um, and obviously, if the more people you show it to, the better as well. And if you don't already, I would encourage you to actually to subscribe to the also Um, and thank you for that. Jill Bond said, it's kind of weird we Here have a Katie Kane and an investor on the same thread. Here Are I we come. in the DC universe? Ha. So Katie Kane is actually that one in the DC universe. I'm a sword. 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 I'm I don't know exactly how I use context, I probably misused it a little bit, but just the idea that you're really, like, you know, you have a big examination of an issue, and then you're proof can rely on a little bit of examination of the issue, and then you can blow that up, and you can kind of we did keep it. doing that infinitely regressive, and focus on increasingly smaller pieces, but apply that same, you know, conspiratorial logic. Um, I'm sorry. Katie Kane says it's her actual name. It's added in 1968, which I believe is roughly when Kate Kane had it in the Batman comics. Um, Rattle um, move! Just so still here. Interesting stuff, you know. This is still the Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. I don't know if this is Mom Raising a Marvel, so I'm not familiar with these two. Shadow Flash! I think that I am more than you see that. But as I got older, Sword I actually got more interested in this. Sword Dance! Sword Dance! Katie Kane says, Tiffy Hines is back on the King game. Oh, hmm. Yeah. 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 Tiffy Hines is the King game. Freaking awesome. Um, the first thing that I've got is, Tiffy Hines is the King game. Tiffy Hines is the King game. Let's keep it up! I hate MSNBC, but I'm out of stuff on CNN <laughs> for the next couple hours because they don't upload anything to their channel before 8 a.m. Central. So, huh? Um. Savings keep on going. How far we've come. 
This week, President Trump issued his own list of, of pardons and commutations, including one oh, to a man whose fast. family I really started making that. huge political you donations you to President Trump's re-election campaign and to the RNC in recent months. Once they started seeking a pardon for one of their family members. They'd never given before, but the family dumped hundreds First of thousands of dollars on the president's re-election campaign and the RNC. And we know it. Bingo, I get to fight. President Trump also attended the richest fundraiser of his entire re-election effort to the He raised ten million dollars in one night. The most expensive fundraiser of his re-election campaign. A typical hold on fundraiser is like fifty thousand dollars a couple. This was over five hundred thousand dollars a couple. The fundraiser was held at the home of a billionaire named Nelson Pope. How did Nelson help become a billionaire? Well, he made a lot of his money thanks to a convicted felon named Michael Wilson, a financier who was indicted for racketeering and securities fraud in 1989, banned from trading for life, and ultimately sentenced to 10 years in prison. Sword. So the fundraiser was helped by this billionaire. The fundraiser was posted by this billionaire who made all his money with his Michael Wilson. That was Saturday night. On Tuesday, President Trump announced that he was pardoning Michael Milken. And he explicitly said in the pardon announcement that the reason he was doing so is because this guy who just hosted the most expensive fundraiser for his re-election campaign had asked him to please pardon Michael Milken. Because again, Here Michael goes. Milken's how he made all his money. And he just set up Donald Trump with millions of dollars for his re-election campaign. This is Literally it! three nights before the pardon. Here I come! And I know that a lot of stuff has happened. <laughs> and there were other people on the list of pardons and commutations who deserve their own after school special in terms of their wild corruption. You know, the wild corruption of their crimes and the wild corruption of their being pardoned by the president in the way you But just, just think about that moment in 2008 that Peter Baker documented. How far we have slid down these slippery slopes of the mountains in just a handful of years. From the desperate Christmas Eve, all hands on deck, freak out, take it back, panic moment in the George W. Bush administration, that was where they door stopped the pardon attorney and took the thing off the guy's desk because they were so worried they might look like they were doing a pardon in exchange for a donation. So now, the full-blown advertisement that, yeah, we're giving you the pardon because of the money you gave us. Because you're a donor or because your friends are donors. And they asked after they gave us the money. I mean, it's, it's not like something they're trying to hide. This is what they're advertising they're doing. One of the prosecutors in the Michael Milken case actually wrote an op-ed about the Milken pardon this week in which he described the, the listing of the campaign donors as the sponsors of specific pardons as, quote, as guileless an admission I have ever seen of a rich man's justice. And so I, I feel like you know, we'll be back this week between the New Hampshire primary and the Nevada caucuses tomorrow, I see the Republican candidate like the show that Russia is trying to elect him again, and the president fired the head of the intelligence community for saying so as the president told the Justice Department to vote for the Nevada caucuses back to the book, despite the seven felony convictions, and the Attorney General tried to make it so. And there's all of this stuff that's poured down on us this week. I feel like the very least. I, I think it calls. Actually, I think it calls. Um, calls for a lot. I'm not sure too. But it, it calls for a lot of other things. It calls for us as a country. It calls for us as citizens to grow up and get real in one way. Which is that we need to stop talking about the threat to the rule of law or the appearance of impropriety, or concerns about the compromise of our de right democratic foundation, or suspicions that our small d democratic constitutional protections might be undermined, or our foundations might potentially be eroded. We, we need to stop pretending like this is Christmas 2008 and there are concerns about whether anybody knew about the really first dad guy dad making the donation. This is not that time anymore. This is not that country anymore. This is not the same government. This is not even the same bad government, right? This is not the fear of the appearance of potential impropriety. What we have now is the advertisement, the broadcast, the insistence of impropriety without consequence. Do you want a presidential pardon? You need connections to me for that. You need to make donations to me or otherwise be recognized as a Trump supporter or somebody who's connected to people who matter to me. That's how you get a pardon. There's no other process other than that.
This is not a behind the scenes dynamic that they're ashamed of and trying to cover up. This is out loud on purpose so as to attract more donations and more ostentatious displays of loyalty. It's designed to make everybody think twice about displaying any visible opposition to this president as well. I mean, people who are against him get the law. Here goes! You try people to save who are his friends, I can help him out. Merry Christmas. And that is the threat. Well, I'm tying this all together, right? This out loud, unabashed, growing broadcast of it. And in the sense, at all levels of the government, and all leaders of power within the government, in the Justice Department, if you are a Trump ally or you were involved in his campaign and you nothing. helped cover up bad behavior by the president that may have helped get him into office, the president will loudly insist that your prosecution is a witch hunt and that he will protect you. If you're a member of a jury, a private citizen who gets called to jury duty, and your jury votes to convict somebody who the president has decided to protect, well, you as a private citizen, you as somebody who will sit on a jury, you'll end up villain of the week on Fox News and denounced by the president repeatedly at rallies oh, well. and online. Course, Think about that when you go into your jury deliberations. Jim! If you're a judge overseeing a case that touches on the president's interests, or, or, or implications of the president's own criminal or otherwise bad behavior. Well, judge, you're about to get famous, too. You're about to get attacked by the president. You'll be attacked on Fox News. You will be threatened to do what the president wants. Think about that when you're deciding on your rulings, judge. Maybe skin is absorbent. Your skin can actually soak up wetness for diaper dozens. That's why I use Pampers. Pampers tracks and locks wetness away, keeping baby skin drier and healthier. The health of your baby's skin starts with the Pampers they're in. If you're in law enforcement, if you're in the FBI or in the Justice Department, and you end up somehow connected to an investigation of this president or his campaign, or you've otherwise been witness to something he has done wrong, well, the weight of the Justice Department will be brought to bear on you. The president will insist on criminal charges against you, Andrew McCabe, former FBI director. You, James Comey, former FBI director, Lisa, Lisa Page, Chief of Staff, Bruce Orr, and any other official who had anything to do with an investigation into the president's bad behavior, never yeah, mind you're in law enforcement, you're in the Justice Department, you will find your careers destroyed, maybe you'll end up being defendant too, because you can make Bill Barr do that, watch. He'll say it publicly and then Bill Barr will do it. I mean, Bill Barr doesn't like the president talking about that out loud, but the president likes talking about that out loud. Because the threat, the promise, is the point. Yeah. And it applies everywhere. It's not in the military. Yeah. Same deal. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vinny, not the whistleblower, not somebody who went to the press. The active duty military decorated wounded combat veteran. He reported up the chain of command exactly as he was told to do when he saw something that he believed needed to be reported up the chain of command. He testified truthfully in response to a lawful subpoena once and only once and has never otherwise spoken. He is frog marched out of the White House, along with his brother, too, for good measure, who had nothing to do with it. Sword dance! The Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, John Rude, fired this week. This is a very senior Pentagon official. His crime was that he was the official who certified that Ukraine had met all its anti-corruption benchmarks, and they should get their military well, that doesn't match the White House line. That doesn't match the defense of the president. So, under Secretary of Defense John Reed, you're fired too. This is the National Security Council. This week, the Deputy National Security Advisor was fired. There's so much else going on, it barely made a ripple. But this is a big deal job. You know Ben Rhodes from the Obama administration? That's the job he had, Deputy National Security Advisor. Well, the Trump Deputy National Security Advisor was fired this week because she was falsely accused of being this the person who wrote that anonymous op-ed that criticized President come. Trump more than a year ago. Ah, and by all accounts, it really seems to have not been her. She's not anonymous. Ah, ah, and White House officials who won't put their names in a quote are telling reporters that the White House has not actually, uh, doesn't actually subscribe to the, the rumors that it's her. But nevertheless, the suspicion that it might be her, that was enough this week to get her fired as Deputy National Security Advisor. She now works in the Energy Department as an advisor instead. Think about that message. They don't believe it was her. But the suspicion is enough. It's not enough that you can't ever criticize the president or, you know, notice that he's done something wrong in the course of your duty. You can't even fall under suspicion of seeming like the kind of person who might criticize the president. That's enough to get you fired even if you didn't actually criticize him.
Also, do you have a sister or a brother? If so, they'll be fired too, presumably. Look at them, they kind of look like you. And now, of course, it's the intelligence community as well. The president is not mad, apparently, at the intelligence community's assessment that Russia is intervening in this next election again to try to reelect him. At least he's not mad at Russia about it. He's mad at the intelligence community about it. He's mad at the intelligence community for warning other elements of the government about the fact that it is happening. The director of national intelligence really was just fired this week because somebody in his office had the temerity to tell Congress what Russia is doing this time to get him elected again. The principal deputy to the director of national intelligence, a 30-year CIA veteran, also ousted. I don't know if you've ever met anybody or if you know anybody who works in U.S. intelligence in any capacity, but think about what their jobs are like today. The president has just broadcast out loud, not hinting, not no implication here, no Victory worries, is ours. no stems, right? There's no hiding it. The president has now broadcast here. If you work in the U.S. intelligence community, and you, in the course of your job protecting this country, discover an attack on our country an attack on our democracy by a foreign adversary, you will be fired if you say that is what you have done. The Director of National Intelligence was just fired because U.S. intelligence agencies have failed now and because someone in his office won Congress. And again, I, I think this kind of events just in the last week or so in our country calls on us as citizens to do any number of things. You tell me, right? These are very dark terms that this country has taken very quickly. But if nothing else, literally the least we can do at this point is to stop talking about concerns, worries, a potential chilling effect, the appearance of impropriety, the appearance of conflict of interest, the appearance of improper political influence, concerns, distress, worry about it. This is not a warning. The dark days are not coming. The dark days are here. And so those of us who have imagined times like this for our country, you know, who might have thought that the heroic thing for us to do as citizens if our country ever took these turns would be to, to, to articulate what's wrong with the direction our country is taking and to warn people about where it's heading. For those of us who thought that would be the kind of heroism that was called for, we were wrong. And heroism was called for? Ooh, because... Wow. At least now, that's no longer the form of heroism that we need. That time is past. These guys are not sneaking around trying to get away with stuff. And the heroism is down to, you know, catching them and telling people what they're doing. They are proclaiming openly that the rules are gone, they will do what they want, the government will be turned against you if you stand against this president. That is not a warning. That is where we are. And so, what do we do? What do we do? Hold that thought. Hey there, I'm yeah, Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching okay. MSNBC. I, I'm on gonna YouTube. Mem you I've got that memorized, sort of, because that's that's something that my uh, parents will need to hear sometimes. Is there a problem here? Hey, you guys look like foodies. Would you like to try our trashy back ribs? Yeah, we're gonna just do a lap and we'll come back. Okay, well, we'll be here. Man, why isn't this working? My mouth is watering. I think that's just your rabies flaring up. Geico sequels. The savings keep on going. Priorities USA is the largest Democratic super PAC. Founded in 2011 by so former dead. Obama advisors to help him in his new election uh, uh, against uh, Mitt Romney. Priorities USA is neutral in the Democratic Party. This year they say their pre-convention budget for ads in the is $150 million. What? Pre-convention, before there's a nominee, they're spending $150 million. Superpack will roll out two new TV ads, the first of the 2020 cycle, starting tomorrow in four battleground states, Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Price tag, $30 million in airtime. Now, we've been given an exclusive look at these ads tonight. Both of them target President Trump. Both will begin airing in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania starting tomorrow. I'm going to show you the most recent first of those ads, featuring the topic most on the minds of Democratic voters, according to the entrance polls in the first few years. The topic is... Shadow Flash! In 2017, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. It feels like a tidal wave. You have no idea what you're doing. Now Donald Trump wants to eliminate protections for pre-existing conditions like mine. Let's keep it, up. it would make it impossible for people like me to find affordable health care. 
I will always be a breast cancer survivor. If Donald Trump had his way, I would no longer have health insurance coverage. Priorities USA Act, he's responsible for the conduct of the sabotage. That's the first ad. And again, remember, this is the super PAC, the Democratic super PAC, that is planning to spend $150 million running ads before yeah. the convention, before the Democratic Party even has a nominee. That's one of the two ads. The second ad uh, isn't on health care, a specific issue like that. It focuses more on the president himself. Here's that one. I have the right to do whatever I want as president. The government shutdown, now officially the longest in American president history. President Trump threatening the future of health care. The president's budget includes a cut of $845 billion to Medicare. President Trump apparently has a lot on his mind, at least according to his Twitter account. Concerns that the new missiles could reach the United States. And ISIS is seizing this chaotic moment to regroup. I have the right to do whatever I want as president. Priorities USA Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. Again, those two TV ads will run in four battleground states starting in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin tomorrow at an initial cost of $30 million in ad time, which is a small but significant chunk of the Super PAC's $150 million pre-convention budget to help Democratic candidates take on President Trump. Joining us now is the chairman of Priorities USA, Guy Cecil. Guy, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to talk to you about this tonight because I feel like the sheer scale of what you're able to do at your very well-funded super PAC uh, makes you a very interesting player in this race. We've got two billionaires in the race among the candidates who are spending hand over fist. Even your spending at the super PAC will be dwarfed by what my, Mayor Bloomberg spends. But what you're planning on spending is so much larger than any we'll of the non-billionaire candidates.